Welcome to another Navigate Tuesday tip. I'm Pam Keslauskas, one of the trainers here at Navigate. And today we're going to be talking about EIV as part of our Mastering the MOR series. This is EIV part two, and we're going to be talking about your EIV master file. When you have your MOR, you're going to be asked for a few different things for EIV. You're going to be asked for your monthly reports or periodic reports, whatever your policy has them run as, and you're going to be asked for your master file. So we're going to talk today about what should be in that master file. So there are some essential documents you want to make sure are in that file. For your coordinators to start with, you're going to have the owner authorization letter. That's the letter from the owner of the property that says that that individual can act as coordinator. The original coordinator access form, so the handwritten one that was originally done. The current coordinator access form. Coordinators should be doing that once yearly. It's typically done online now, so you would just print out the page. You're going to have their most recent rules of behavior, so that's within 12 months. Their most recent cyber awareness challenge, again, within 12 months. And any other policies that the owner agent has personnel signing. When you get to the users, the collection of what you have is similar. So here is the owner authorization form. Now this is not a set form. This is one that you are going to do or your management company is going to do. I've mocked one up for you so you can see what should be in it. You should be naming the owner, naming the company, the entity that owns the properties, the individual that you're authorizing, and then the properties along with their project number, contract number, and tax ID number. So that's going to be sent with your original coordinator access form in order to gain access to EIV. And this document needs to stay in the file. This is the cyber awareness page. So just wanted to point out here, you want to make sure that you are using the most recent cyber awareness challenge. This is the 2024 one. You want to make sure that you're picking all other users, not the DOD users. And you can honestly, if you don't have this link, you can just do a search for cyber awareness challenge or DOD cyber awareness challenge, and it should be fairly easy to find this page. Next, we're going to talk a little bit about users. So users are going to have, just like the coordinators, their original access form. It's called a UAAF in this case. They're UAAFs for the last year. One of the findings that we see pretty frequently is that you're not authorizing users twice a year. It should be done twice a year. The rules of behavior and cyber awareness only need to be done once a year but you need to request authorization twice a year. And most companies have a policy of this is when we do our cyber awareness and our rules of behavior. For the, UA, the users, you are also going to be having any owner policies that are signed. So if users sign the EIV policies, you're going to have that signature in there as well. For non-users, people that do not have M numbers, so sometimes it's an administrative assistant who helps put together files but does not have access, it could be an auditor, it is generally not your RSC. Remember, RSCs do not have access to tenant files, just like management personnel don't have access to the RSC files. So if your RSC is looking to get a copy of benefits statements, from EIV, that should be coming from the tenant. So you can provide a copy to the tenant, but you should not be providing those to the RSC. So for non-users, you're gonna be getting the rules of behavior signed by everybody. And they should also be going through that cyber awareness training. And then those are gonna be kept in the file. You also may have EIV policies that everyone signs. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the frequency of your reports. There are some reports that HUD says you have to run until things check out. There are others that HUD gives owner discretion on when to run them. 
you need to follow the HUD guidelines and your own internal owner agent procedures. So, you know, there's no set schedule for some of those things. That's going to be on policy with a lot of the reports. But please note that there are changes expected with HOTMA. So for right now, you're going to follow your existing policies. And then when HOTMA kicks in, you're going to follow the policies as in your revised EIV policy. So we're going to talk about the existing tenant search and the multiple subsidy report. The existing tenant search and the multiple subsidy report are often confused. The existing tenant search is going to be run before occupancy. So despite the name that says existing tenant search, it's not run for your existing tenants. It's run on your applicants to find out if they are existing tenants somewhere else. So the existing tenant search is the one that you run before occupancy. This has to be run before somebody moves in. If you run it once they've signed the lease, it's already late. So run it before they sign the lease. It's going to identify whether or not your tenant is in subsidized units elsewhere. And one of the things that is probably a good idea is if you don't wait until that final day, the day they're signing to run it, run it as part of your screening. Run at the same time you do their background check, their references, if you take them, all of that. Okay, so the multiple subsidy report is one of those reports you're running periodically for everyone. That's going to tell you whether one of your tenants is getting a new subsidy somewhere else. So this one is going to look at anytime they're getting subsidy after they've moved into your property. So if you look on, this is a, uh, a screenshot from EIV Secure Systems. Existing tenant search is one of the reports. Multiple subsidy is a separate report. So existing tenant search is for applicants. Multiple subsidy is for tenants. One of the big issues that we see at MORs is not having dates on reports. You need to be sure that your reports have the dates either printed on them or if all else fails and you can't get those dates to print, handwrite the date and your initials, just like you would do with an application. You're either going to stamp it or you're going to write the date and initial it. With this, it's either going to print out on the report or you're going to handwrite the date and initial it. You can consult your tech support if they're not printing. It's just changing the settings on your computer most of the time to get it to print out. But you do need to make sure the dates are on those reports. It's the only way that we're going to be able to tell when we come for your MLR whether those reports will run on time. So you want to make sure that those dates are on all of those periodic reports. You also want to make sure that they're on your 90-day reports. Okay, so this is, if you look in the top left to me as you're looking at the screen corner, that's where those dates are going to print if they're printing. If you don't see them, you want to make sure that you are handwriting the date and your initials on there so that we have. Okay, and that is it. If you have any questions, please contact us, Vicki or myself, and have a good day, and we'll see you in the next Tuesday tip.